and I almost had it all back. Like I'm, I'm, I'm six figures deep at this point. And I remember all I was, I was maybe three or 4,000 pounds, three or 4,000 dollars, sorry, Australian dollars short of, of getting everything back. And I, I remember sitting there, it's about four o'clock in the morning at this point, And I remember saying to myself, wow, you've nearly got all this back. Once you've got it all back, you can fix everything. You can pay it all back. And there was a voice in the back of my head that just went, you won't, you won't stop. And I just, I just buried that voice. I was just like, nah, I just, I didn't listen to that voice. But I remember it was my, it was my own voice saying to me, you won't stop. I just ignored it. I was like, I know what I'm doing. So that was the Friday night, Saturday morning, 4 a.m. By the Monday, I'd lost it all. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast today. Uh, today's a bit, a bit different than normal. And uh, I think it's quite important because so I've got my friend Daniel with me and he's, he's just recently started his own YouTube channel and he's sharing his own journey into gambling addiction, overcoming it, and personal development. So I thought it's quite a powerful message that even if a couple of people get something from it, then it's where I was sitting down for an hour and having a talk. So I've got no questions, and a lot of the stuff I don't know. So I'm actually going to, like, this is my honest reaction to this. So I've known Danny for nearly 20 years, but some of this stuff is, like, extremely personal. So we're, we'll dig into it just for the benefit of anybody listening. So uh, the, the, now I've got no place to start. So Danny, do you want to introduce yourself and just start at the beginning yeah. and we'll just see how it goes? Yeah. And just first of all, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Just, uh, I feel absolutely privileged just to be even asked to come on here. Just the, the channel that you've built up, the, the years of hard work you've put into it and the following you've gathered. And like, I'm, I'm completely new to YouTube. I'm, I'm trying to, trying to get my message out there now for what we're going to talk about today, but. It's just a privilege to, to be on here and, and to be asked to come on, mate. So really appreciate it. So basically, I struggled with a gambling addiction for over 20 years. And then three years ago, I finally got on top of it. And I've been doing work each and every day since then to, to improve my life and sort to get my life back together. And I just want to, I just want to basically help someone not have to go through the, the 20 years of struggle that I went through. If I can, if I can, if my message just hits home at one person and, and helps them get on top of this addiction before it takes over their life, then, then my mission is, is fully achieved. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the, to the very beginning. So my, my gambling started when I was, I was very young. I was in my early teens. And whenever I, I do reflect back, there's always, there's always like two things that, that I go back to that stand out in my mind that I. I've spoke to gambling counselors about, and they played a big part in, in why I became addicted to gambling. So as I've said, my name is Daniel. My, one of my family members is called Georgie, and there was a horse called Chief Dan George, and Tony McCoy would often be on it. It was a, a very well-known jockey. And basically me and all my family members always used to bet on it just for the, for the, for the namesake. Basically it was, it was me and, and a close family member's name. And. I must have been 12, 13, 14, I don't know, but we basically, we'd all had a, had a bet on it. I remember being in my mum's living room, my, me, my brother, my mum, my sister, my dad, and a few other family members. And we were, we were watching this race and he had gone miles behind. Like the, the horse looked like it was finished. It was right at the back of the pack. And I actually found out afterwards, the odds on Befe, the in running odds actually went out to 999 to one. That's how, that's how, how far back it was. It looked like it just had no chance. And somehow Tony McCoy got it through, brought it back to life and it, it flew home. And just like that euphoric feeling, like I can't even remember how much I had on it. I was only early teens, so I probably didn't even win that much, but it was just the fact the whole family, like. Like we were all, we were out, we were dead and buried and it just come back and the whole family at one end and just that, all the family being together, like everyone jumping up, everyone being so happy, so ecstatic, like that feeling of euphoria was just spread amongst us all. And yeah, it just, that was, that was like the foundation for me. I, I've always put it back to that, just that feeling that it, it wasn't even so much about the, the money. It was just like yeah. all my family being together as one and all experiencing that. So I, I always think that's, that's where it started. That was where the very first thing happened. And then probably within the next 12 months, I went round to my local betting shop. I'm, I must have been with my dad or something to be able to put the, the football accumulator on. I was only 14, maybe 15. And I picked four teams and put one pound on it. And I remember watching Gillette Soccer Saturday, watching the, uh, watching the results come in. 
And two of those games, I I'd bet on a draw. And they were like the two, the two games were either what the home team was winning or the away team was winning. It was basically, there was one goal in it. And in the 90th minute, one of the teams equalized. So three of my four teams were all up at that point. But the, the other one that I needed the draw on was still, was still 2-1, I think it was. It was Wolves versus Coventry. I still remember it over 20 years ago. And it was about a 93rd minute equalizer. And again, just that feeling of euphoria, like it came in in the last minute. And I think I won, I think it was 140 pounds. Something like that, but I was 14 or 15 years old to that. Like, I'd never seen that much money in my life. So that was just like an incredible feeling again. That was more of an isolated one. Like I was the only person experiencing that. Like the, the first one I told you about, that was all my family experiencing it. That was like, that was the joy of, of me being happy and everyone around me being happy. But then this one was more of an isolated one, but it was just me. So your, your early memories then are basically success with it like get time and it's a, it caused yeah yeah but pretty much like they say beginner's luck i call it beginner's unluck because it's just like that's that's what got me started that's what what got me hooked basically that that moment of isolation where i, I won all that money and then actually having that money in my hand like 140 pound at that age i was just like wow this is yeah. this is what i'm gonna do this i'm gonna make a lot of money money that's a lot of money when you're 14, isn't it? Because I, 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 well, I, I do kind of get it because I know in Liverpool we have the Grand National. So I, I do understand, like, we used to sit around and uh, watch the family, the races. It, it's, it's quite a big cultural thing in Liverpool. I, 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 I guess we both come from Liverpool and it's a, big, it's a big football city as well. So you're Everton, I'm Liverpool, watching it with your family. And I, I guess it kind of does have a culture of uh, betting as well, associating with these things. Because when you go to match, the betting stall's there. It, it, and, and it, it's not just betting on a goal score, like you said, it's betting on a draw. You like you, you, you look forward to a draw, but you made something exciting on of um out of nothing. So I can see why at a young age you were yeah, definitely it was definitely the the family elements were like it's it's acceptable. Because like obviously my family weren't yeah. letting me bet, bet on that horse thinking he's gonna be hooked on gambling for the next twenty years. That was like that was a an inclusive moment that the whole family could feel like it was a bit of harmless, harmless fun, which most people can keep it as harmless fun, but just for uh, for certain people like myself, it, it gets out of control. The the very first time, like I remembered, like sh- wow, this is this is a problem. I think I was seventeen, and I'd been able to to manipulate a, an online betting company that I I had an account with them, even though I was only seventeen. I can't remember how, but I didn't have to prove my age. Basically, I was I was depositing money despite being under eighteen, and. I remember one night I, I asked my mum just before she was going to bed, I said, can I, can I use your card and can I put £10 into my account, please? I just want to play some poker. And again, my mum, just thinking it was a bit of harmless fun, allowed me, give me a card and, and she went off to bed and I put the £10 into play poker. And by the time she woke up the next morning, I had deposited something like £1,700 just, just chasing my losses. Just like I'd lost that £10. I'll, I'll put another £10. I'll put another 10 oh, shit, I'll put £100 in. I'll put it and. Like the next morning I was like, oh, like I'm in big trouble here. Like once, once I'd gone past a certain amount, it was just like, there's no going back now. I need to win this money back. I can't, I can't tell my mum I've wasted a hundred pounds. I put another hundred in and then I can't tell I've wasted 200 and it was just chasing my tail. It's called, it's called chasing your losses. And by, by the morning I was just, I was like devastated. I didn't know what to do. And I couldn't, I couldn't face up to her. I couldn't tell my mum. And then a, a few days later, she. I was sat on the couch and she's come down to, I remember the, the free, the internet company was called FreeServe. And she said to me, uh, the, the, I've got a letter from FreeServe saying that they haven't been able to take their money out of the account the, this month. Do you, do you know anything about it? And I, I said to my mom, I was like, listen, sit down. I've got something to tell you. And I, I told her what, what I did. And I remember like, she was just gobsmacked. Like my mum my was never one for discipline. I was never like grounded or anything like that growing up. Yeah. And she was just like gobsmacked and she just walked out the room and like, I was sat on that couch like, wow, I, I, I need to stop this now. This is like, this is out of hand. Like I can't, can't ever do that again. I've gambled with someone else's money. That was the first ever time like, I had used someone else's money to gamble with. And I was like, this is like, this is, this is becoming a problem now. I need to stop this. But uh, no. it, it, it didn't stop. No. I can, well, I can, I can, I can imagine like, so I guess you probably started off putting like small five pound ten pound bet and then when it got to like minus 200 you just kind of went like panicked i guess 
that's it. Like, yeah, like, I couldn't, I couldn't start. I couldn't face up to it. I need, I need to win this money back. Like she'll, she'll forgive me if I put the money back. That was, that was my mentality. When of course she, she'd be distraught either way at, at the fact that a, a 17 year old son had done this. And yeah, unfortunately, the more you invest in gambling, the more you lose, the more you feel like you're due a win. So the more invincible you feel. And then, yeah, I'll just put another 500. I'll get it back. I'll get it back. But unfortunately, it never, uh, it never works out. So, so what happened after that then? So you sat down, you've, you timed your mom this. How, how did that it, progress to more gambling? It Not never really experience. got addressed. Like my, my mum, bless her, I love her. I love her. Like she is my world. But she, like I say, she was never one for discipline. So it was never sort of, I was never like sat down and told her. So it was sort of like, as the week's gone on, it's sort of, it's buried into the background. It's suppressed. It's forgotten about. And the, the gambling continued. I think looking back now, it was like, Right, I, I need to get that money back. I'm, I'm, I'm in, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in debt to gambling now. I need to win that money back, and then once I'm ahead, then I'll. Stop. It was always like once I get to, I've, I did a video about destination addiction. It's like once I get to this amount, then I'll stop. Once I get here, I'll stop, and that was always the way. But it, it never stopped. I remember when I, I turned eighteen. The day I turned eighteen, I took out free credit card like instantly. The day I turned eighteen, I, I was allowed to go to casinos then because I was eighteen. Whereas I could only do it online before that because I had like this this secret account. Once I turned eighteen, I, I took free free credit cards out, and I always remember there was a credit card called Mint, and it wasn't a rect the rect it had a curved edge. It was sort of like the shape of my nose on the edge of the card. I, I always remember that. But yeah, I took three credit cards out on my eighteenth birthday, and within a day or two, they were they were all maxed out. It was just. It was just like, uh, it was spiraling, like that, spiraling out of control. And it was always, once I get to this, once I get it back, I'll stop. Once I get it back, did, I'll stop. But did it you, just, did you find the casinos more exciting than online or was it not really even about that? I think the casinos were, were more exciting. Yeah. Because I'd sort of, I, I, I think it was, it was about the reputation that I had in the casino. Cause I'm in there, I'm throwing, I'm throwing hundreds of pounds down on, on one spin of roulette and people are looking at me like. Wow. Yeah. Like I remember, I remember one guy just like drunk next to me and he's just like, wow, well, what do you do? Like you, you can just waste money like that. And that made me feel like, like a millionaire. It made me feel on top of the world. Like oh, everyone thinks I'm this big guy. When in, in reality, it probably wasn't even my money I was betting with. And I, I, I'd be up to my debt and eyeballs with credit cards and whatnot because of how much I was gambling. But that I was allowed to escape into that dream world where oh, everyone thinks I'm a big shot. Everyone thinks I'm, I'm this guy. And at the same time, simultaneously, once I win all this money, I will actually be that big guy that, that they all think I am. And I will, I will have all this money behind me. I can buy all these fast cars and nice houses, but it was, it was just always, it's called the dream world of the compulsive gambler. It's like, it's, it never, never stopped. The, the first time I won life changing money, I was actually 19 years old and it was, it was back online and I was playing roulette on Betfair and I was, I was doing 1000 pound spins on basically red or black. And I had like a really good run and I actually got up to, to 20,000 pounds, like 19 years old. I had 25 pounds in, in my account and I'm like, <gasps> I'm like they, my girlfriend at the time, I'm thinking of the cruise that I'm going to take here on. I'm thinking of the car I'm going to buy. I'm like, this, this is me. So because I'd had that account from when I was under 18. I, to, to withdraw the amount, I had to go through like PayPal, I had to go through a, a weird way. So it took a couple of days to, to get the money out, but I, I, I was able to withdraw it instantly, but then it took a couple of days before I knew it was on my account. And I remember it was, it was a Thursday morning. Every morning I was waking up, refresh my balance. Oh, it's not there yet. This, this Thursday morning, I looked about 10 AM and 20,000 pounds was in my bank account. And I was like, oh, and I was like, this, this is me. I am made now. And I, I was in work at 2 p.m. that day. I worked in the gym at the time and my shift started at 2 p.m. And I was like, you know what? I've got a few hours to kill. I'll, I'll just, I'll see if my luck's in. I'll have a little look on back first, see what's going on. By the time I went to work at 2 p.m. that day, out of that 20,000 pound, I had 300 pound left. And I was just, I was like a zombie. It was just like, from the euphoria of like my life is going to turn around now they've got all the, I, I was on four pound 53 an hour in the gym i was getting four pound 50 per an hour i had twenty thousand pounds like more than a year's wage there and within three hours it was it was gone and again it was just like like how, how is how is this happening so I, I spoke about it before like once i get to this amount i'll stop like i won twenty thousand pounds that should be like that's enough to stop 
but I just move the goalposts. I'd be like, this is what twenty thousand pound feels like. What does what does a hundred thousand pound? What does one hundred and fifty for that? And there was no amount that now, twenty years later, I can look back and say there was no amount that would have stopped that. But while I was tied up in the addiction, just I was I was constantly following that. Once I get to here, I'll stop. Once I've won all this back, I'll stop. But it, yeah, like I say, it was just it never stopped. I mean, like once you're putting a thousand pound the spin on and you've got that excitement, what's what ten pound the spin? I guess it's like it, there's no point doing it, is there? Exactly. Or I guess exactly. I had a feeling that you probably had. While I was doing it, I was always convinced it was about the money. Like I say, once I get to this amount, I'll stop. But now, in hindsight, I can see it. It was just the thrill of the bet. Like I've, 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 uh, I've researched studies and looked at papers and stuff since and. Uh, like a compulsive gambler's brain lights up just as much while that wheel is spinning around the roulette wheel, while the ball is spinning around the roulette wheel, lights up just as much as the anti- as you're waiting for the outcome, like the anticipation of the bet, as the outcome, whether it's win or loss. The the anticipation is just as as exciting, it's just as thrilling as winning the money or losing the money. And I, I was I was never able to see that while I was doing it. Only afterwards that. Help me understand why I couldn't stop, why I kept going back again, why, why it was just, why I was obsessed with it, why every minute of every day was just thinking like, where's the next bet going to be? Where am I going to get the next bit of money from? I mean, it's, it's similar to, um, I don't know, I'm thinking about like Tyson Fury. I remember he had the pursuits, remember when he was going for the, the world championship. And then I think when he won the world championship, I think he said that's when his, I don't, I don't know if it was depression or I don't, I don't know, I can't remember what he said he went through, but it's almost like once he achieved the goal, there was nothing next. So then he kind of dropped off. And then he, he had to get back into the sport to then like the journey, like you said, is much more exciting than the actual outcome. That's just like. Right. It is. It's not about the destination. It's, it's enjoying the journey along the way. And uh, just like looking back now, I can see every, every negative thing that happened in my life. I, I'd go and gamble to escape that. Like I just, I just wasn't equipped to deal with negative emotions, like grief, boredom, loneliness, loss. Any of those things happened, I'd, I'd go and gamble. Like I failed my my driving test, I, I I went to gamble. I my my granddad passed away, I I went to gamble. Like any any excuse, anything that I would I wasn't feeling good about myself. Gambling was just the escape. Gambling was the quick. I can go and feel amazing, without without accepting the fact that I'm only going to feel good for that ten minutes, that thirty minutes, that hour that I'm doing it, and then I'm going to feel ten times worse because of the financial damage I've done because of the lies I've told again. And it was just, it was just a constant, constant cycle. Like it took, it took over my life at this point. Like I was working in the gym every, every first hour of my shift, it would just be, I'd have the newspapers out. I'd be picking my horses out for the day. And then it was always, I I like, I'll, I'll pick this horse. This is the one I'm going to go on. But then when that would lose, I'd then chase and chase and chase until all my money was gone. And whatever, whatever other money I could, I could get hold of would be gone. The, the scary thing about it was that like that, this addiction, I was able to, to appear from the outside, like a completely functioning adult, but it's not like a, an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction where people can start to like see the deterioration in your, in your health. Like, oh, the stress it caused me was, was unbelievable. I was able to sort of keep that buried deep down and, and from the outside looking in, everyone just thought I was, I was a completely normal person. Where I was, I think I, I think I knew you. I think I, kn- I think I met you when you were like, I think you were a year older than me. So I think when I went to college, I was like age 17, 18. So I probably knew you during this time. I, I, I don't really remember it all being about gambling. I, I, I do remember you being like happy and I, I guess like he's a maskiner kind of. Yeah, it was. That like was not that, appearing, like, yeah. That's, that's what I say. It's like, it's the scariest addiction for me because you can hide it so well without outside world seeing it, but it's just so isolating. Like the, the suicide rates for a gambling addict are just so much higher than other addictions because of how isolating it is, how, how alone you feel because nobody knows what you like, what you're doing. And it's, it's, uh, don't, I'm not like getting, asking people to get the violin out here. It's my choice that I'm, I'm choosing to keep that up, keep that to myself. I'm choosing not to tell anyone because I don't want anyone to know what I'm doing. I, I want to, I want to keep going doing this until, until I get myself out of this mess, which the, the uh, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. That's what I was doing for 20 years. It was just like, I was never able to accept, I, I cannot control this. There's, there's no amount that I'll stop. At. There's nothing. So what, so what happened after this? 
after you lost 20 grand that it just keep it, how do you keep going do you just keep getting loans out and like progress so like that? because because i had credit cards from 18 years old I, my my uh, my credit score was was never good there was one dodgy company that I actually found in, in Liverpool city centre that I was able to get, I was able to get a loan off, pardon the, pardon the stereotype. I, uh, so this was, this was 15 years ago or so. So technology wasn't what it is now. I was able to, to print off or not print off. I was able to, to print screen a load of my bank statements, take them into paint and just hide the, the betting, hide the betting yeah. withdrawals, basically hiding the, the, the damage that the, the, the betting companies were doing to my bank. And then I took them in and, and they, they believed it. They like, they, they fell for it and they gave me a loan. Instantly gambled that loan away. That was gone within, I can't remember, but it wouldn't have been long. It would have been days at best, if not a week. And then they came knocking at my, at my mum and dad's house for, for yeah. like they literally sent two of their workers around. Cause I was just ignoring their calls, ignoring their emails, ignoring their messages. Cause I, I, I couldn't pay them back. I wasn't. I didn't have money. Every, every, every cent I got, every pound I got was, was going straight back to Gamla, just trying to dig myself out of this hole. And I remember they come to the front door and knocked at the front door and my dad was like, what's this? And I had to, that was like one of the first times I had to get uh, my parents to sort of bail me out. I had to get money off my family to, to pay this loan back and, and then sort of pay them back. But, uh, yeah, I remember I tried it again with a, a different loan company, I did the same thing where I was, I was hired and I, I used the same, the same modified statements that I'd done with this one. But by this point, they were like over six months out of date. And I remember I, I t I'm in the office with the girl. I've shown her the, the statements, the modified statements. And she's like, uh, the, the two that they're, they're past the, they're over six months old. We can't use these. I need to, I need to go on, log on with you now and get some like current up to date statements. So I had to do it in front of her and she could see all the, the, the betting company just all over my, my, uh, deposits, my withdrawals. And she was just like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you a loan looking at this. And I, I'd, I'd like, I, again, I just I can't, I couldn't deal with negative emotions. I couldn't deal with confrontation. I just, like, okay, just one sec, just let me go to the toilet and I'll be right. And I, I ran out of the building and I just, I never went because again, only in hindsight, looking back, I was just, I was unable to, to. So to deal with life on life's terms, I couldn't deal with confrontation. I couldn't feel, couldn't deal with, with making like people on, having uncomfortable conversations with people. I just run away and, and hide behind the gambling type of thing. So why did you keep doing it? Were you just keep trying to, did you keep trying to recover what you'd lost? Was that kind of like. That's, that's what I, I, I always told myself as I was doing it. I always said, uh, once I get all, I want to, I'll stop. Yeah. But I remember uh, in a, a gambling counseling session that I did, they, they, put a graph up on, on the screen for me. And it, it basically started up the top where I was 12, 13 years old when I first bet and my finances started going like that. Then I get a win, it lift up a bit and then it go down and then I get a win and it lifts up a bit. And I sort of, I was able to see the bigger picture. Then I was like, it's just constantly going down. If I do get a win, it just puts a little, a little tiny boost in it. And then it just goes down again. Any winnings were just used for ammunition to go back again it was just it was ammunition to go and gamble again i never yeah, did anything yeah. after winnings the, the the odd time I, I did actually win was they were few and far between but it was just ammunition to go back again and like i say my life was just spiraling out of control at this point but i was still from the outside in functioning but at, at this point i was working in in uh, lark lane in liverpool and i'd, I'd finish up in the restaurant where i worked like 11 o'clock midnight sometimes go over to the bar across the street where my friends worked, have a few drinks with them. I drive home drunk, get changed, drive back to Lark Lane. They'd finish in the bar. I take them into, into Liverpool city center and we'd go and have a night out. And I was, I was drink driving three times a week, four times a week. And I always remember my sister saying to me, why, 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 please stop it. Stop, stop doing the drink driving. I don't want to have to put my, my baby brother in a coffin. And I said to her, I get away with it. Why, why wouldn't I do it? I'm like, I was just, I, I felt invincible. I was like, I said, I always said to her, if anything ever happens, I'll stop. And then in 2012, so I was 25, I actually had a, a, a massive car crash. I was, I drunk drove home. There was, there was six of us in the car originally. Luckily I, I dropped one person off in just outside the city center. So there was five people in the car. And we were, my mum was away on holiday and we were going back to, to my mum's house. And there's a, a rather steep hill on a bit of a bend, just 
literally 30 seconds away from my mom's front door. And I, I have no memory of, of the actual incident, but I've, I've come down this hill and it's, it's curving down to the right. My back left tire has clipped the curb, but I've been going that fast. That back left tire clipping the curb was enough to flip the car over onto the left. Carry on going down the hill. So at this point, the car is scraping down like on the left door, basically it's scraping down the hill. It's hit a curb at the, at the bottom, like halfway down the hill. It's flipped over onto the roof. And then it slid down an embankment and, and ironically finished in the back of a pub, ended up smashing into the back of a pub. And like, that was sort of the first time that it all came out on top. That was the first time, like everyone could see, wow, it's like, it, like everyone can see into this, this, this world that I've been hiding the whole time. I'm actually like, I am like, uh, like I'm, I'm not fully functioning. I'm not a functioning adult. I'm not as, as, as normal as people appear like i've got this secret life that i'm living and it was it was really bad the the five of us in the car i i came to the next morning and my sister's standing over me in my hospital bed and there's a policeman standing at the bottom of the bottom of my bed and i've just i've got no memory of the previous night and i'm just i'm all dazed and first thing i said to my sister what what what's happened why, why is there why is there a policeman at the bottom of my, of my bed and my sister said like you you you're okay but you you were you were in a car crash last night and it instantly just come back to me i remember being out on a night out and then driving drunk my heart just and my first question i said to my sister i was like how is everyone how's everyone else who was in the car with me and she said like it, it, there's there's problems but you're you're the worst one like everyone's sort of okay now there's no no like life or death stuff you're you're the worst one and that was a bit of a relief to sort of hear that that i hadn't hurt anyone more than myself but i actually got the uh, brain damage in in two parts of my brain from it to they had to have like an emergency operation on on my head while i was unconscious and the, the two parts i would say this the two parts of my brain that got damaged one of the parts was my memory part and the irony is i can't remember what the other part was a bit brain damage but it was it was serious stuff like i had to go to to a brain brain clinic for months afterwards and do like exercises where I'd get asked the question, like, name as many animals as you can that, that you'd see in the zoo. And then I'd get asked other questions. And then they'd say, like, go, and go back to that first question. Name all those animals that you named four questions ago. And it, it was pretty bad for a few months. Like, my family say I was, I was a different person for, for, like, four weeks, five weeks after the crash. And I, I stayed off work and everything stayed home for, for a while till I sort of rehabilitated. So at age 28, I, or 29, I, I moved over to Sydney. Age 28, two of my friends were, were going traveling around Southeast Asia and they were going to finish off in, in Sydney, Australia. And two weeks before they were going, I actually won a, a large amount in a New Brighton casino. And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go traveling. I was like, I'm going to use this money to go traveling. So it was one of the few times I left the casino with money. I remember coming back home. It was seven o'clock in the morning. My mom's just getting up for work and I've just pulled out this, this wad of cash and been like, look at what I've won. Expecting it to be like, over the moon and she was just like you've gambled again and i was like yeah but like look look at all the money i've won and she's just like you've gambled again you said you were going to stop and you, you're still doing it like you can't stop and that was another like eye opener for me where i was like like I, i've always thought once i win all that money once I, I can i can buy my mom a summer house in australia once i can buy all the fast cars everyone will forgive me but at that moment in time my mom was more disappointed that I'd gambled than thrilled with the money I'd won. And I was like, yeah, so you've lost the approval then, haven't you? Exactly. Like, like the the trust, sorry, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've destroyed the trust again. I've, I've done all the emotional damage despite the financial gain. But nonetheless, I was like, right, give the money to me, mum. I was like, you hold on to this. I'm going traveling in two weeks. And then in that two week period, I was able to, to get access to 50% of that money, not through my mum, but through a friend that I mentioned earlier that had money saved, I was able to actually get 50% of that money from him and gamble with it and lost it all. Luckily, it was only 50% of, of, the, of that winnings. If it, if it was 100%, I would have took all 100% and I would have lost it all. Yeah. But I'd lost 50% of it, so I had to call my mum and say, listen, mum, I need, I need £5,000 of that, of that money. I've got to go and give it to someone. I've just lost it. I remember pulling up outside of work like I say, my mum never was never one for discipline, never got angry with me. It was always, always like loving towards me. I pulled up outside the work and she just threw this envelope in the car window at me and stormed off. And I was like, oh shit, I've like, I've really upset her again here. 
yeah. was able to give give that money back to the person. Luckily, like I say, I only had access to fifty percent of it, so my mom still had the other fifty percent. So I was still able to to go traveling with that money. And I remember the first day of traveling, the friend that I went with pulled me to one side and he said to me, "I've got one rule for you while while we're traveling." And I'm like, "Yeah, go on. What is it?" And he went, "No gambling." He's like, "I do not want you. If you gamble, I know you'll have to go home. So please don't gamble." And you know what? We went round Vietnam, Cambodia, Bali, the little Gili Islands, and then to Australia. And I didn't gamble for those two months that we were traveling. Like, I think I was just, I was just having so much fun. I was just like, wow, I was, I was made for this, like the traveling lifestyle. I love it. And it never crossed my mind to gamble. Like the two months I didn't even think about the bet. Once I got to Sydney, I discovered the casino in Sydney and within a few days I'd, I'd managed to lose the, the last of my money. Yeah. I called my family. I was able to get bailed out and, and get some money sent over to, to still sort of do the last, the last eight days or nine days that I had left of my trip. I locked up at the gray skies in Liverpool and I was like, I'll come to Sydney. I'll move to Australia. So I knew I was going over there. So I was like, right, I need to get myself together. I need to get my act together. So I actually started seeing a, a gambling counselor seven months before I was due to move over there in May. And it was the longest I'd ever gone without gambling. I was actually seven months clean when I got over there. I was very upfront with, with Julie at the time. I told her, I told her what, what the go was, where I was up to, how I'm trying to get on top of it. And she was very supportive of me. She actually found the local Gamblers Anonymous meetings for me to attend when I got there. And I was, I was really shocked at that. I was like, wow, like that's shit. I need to hold on to this girl. Like she's, she's really, really good for me. She's like really supportive and that. And for the first maybe eight months, nine months I was there, I, I didn't gamble. Like I was, it was like this new lease of life. They say in Gamblers Anonymous, you can't run away from your problems. You can't geographically escape. You can't switch country. And I sort of, I did that and stopped gambling. And I was sort of like, I, I think you can do this actually. Like I've got no urge or nothing to go to the casino. I hadn't gambled for like the eight months, nine months that I was there. I was getting paid every week into my bank account. I had a savings account. I had money in a savings account. Nobody, no, uh, no, what are they called? No debt collectors were chasing me. It was like this new lease of life. So I actually had a, a nice credit score. Like I built a credit score up over there because the one in England was just, was exhausted from the loans and the, the credit cards. And I just sort of let them ride into CCJ. So my credit rating here was destroyed. But over there, I had this new lease of life. Yeah. So I moved over there May 2016. And until June, July 2017, I was completely away from a bet. And it, like, it, was, it was good. Just that peace of mind was amazing, not worrying about things. In June, July 2017, I discovered Bitcoin. And I actually found this... this uh, I can't remember what it was called now, but basically it was leverage trading. So for anyone who doesn't know what leverage trading is, basically it multiplies your winnings, but it also multiplies your losses. So I'm not actually investing in Bitcoin. I'm not buying a Bitcoin, if you like. I'm betting Bitcoin's going to go up or I'm, I'm shorting and betting Bitcoin's going to go down. So it was basically multiplied by 33. So for every every 3% Bitcoin went up, I got 99% of my, of my money. I doubled my money. Every three, if it went down 3% and I, I got to, like, I lost the equivalent of my investment, say I put 1,000 pound in and it would go down 3%, I'd then lose that 1,000 pound. It's not like an investment, but it would just go down and it'd come back again. Once it went to zero, that 1,000 pound was gone. They, they could take my money and it was gone. However, we spoke about it at the very start of this. The beginner's luck hit. The very first day I did Bitcoin, I made like 2,000 pound. And I was just like, this is it. This is what I was made for. I stupidly spent all my time on the roulette wheel and doing horses and doing football. This is what I was supposed to be doing. Cryptocurrency, this is what I'm made for. So all them, all them thoughts are going through my head, all that euphoria. This is, this is, this is me. I finally found my calling. So this was a Friday when I won that money. We were going, we were going for a hike around what's called the Blue Mountains. It's a very scenic place in Sydney. It's, it's basically big mountains, big hikes. So as you can imagine, the phone signal isn't very good in certain parts of that. And as I've woke up that morning, the Saturday morning, the money has started to go down. My winnings have started to disappear. As I'm on the hike, I'm looking and like all my money has gone. The money that I originally put in has gone at this point. Bitcoin, it's not even knows that. It's, it's maybe gone down 5%, which is nothing. For Bitcoin, it can swing 10% in and out. Gone down like 5% and I've, I've started to lose everything. I've emptied my savings account in, put my savings account in there. I actually had a credit card that, was, that had zero 
that hadn't like it, it was fully it wasn't maxed out if you like i'd never used it i just had it to build my credit rating up that credit card went straight in so this is all day one of doing bitcoin and just the switch in my head just flicked i hadn't i hadn't gambled for like 18 months and then i was just right back i remember going around the blue mountains like trying to get a phone signal trying to put this money on like reaching up in the air to get the phone as high as i can and it was just incredible how it only took one thing to just completely flick me straight back into that mode used all the money i had saved up maxed out the credit card a few days later because like i say my credit rating was so good over there i was actually able to get a twenty five thousand dollar loan from my bank straight into bitcoin it lasted me longer than most of the loans had previous i was playing for a few weeks even a few months maybe of just riding the roller coaster up and down up and down until september 2017 it was all gone I'd gone from putting, I think I put like $500 in and won 2,000 pound on that first day to I'd now lost all my money. I'd used all of my savings. I'd maxed out a credit card and I just took a loan out. All of this behind Julie's back. So again, it was just straight back to those horrible feelings of isolation, hiding away from everyone, living this secret life that nobody knows about. And it, it was just like, it's incredible how quick I was just straight back into that mode. Ended up manipulating Julie into letting me use some of her credit card money, uh, some of her credit card money. And then I, after I lost that, I just, I had nowhere to turn to. And I had to come clean to Julie and tell, tell her what, what had happened. Yeah. After many weeks of, of like un, uncertainty around my relationship, like I had moved to Sydney just to be with this girl, like whether I was even going to stay in Sydney or was I going to move back home? Julie was able to forgive me. The, the one stipulation was she now controls all the money. She now controls all the finances. So a video I, I did last week was about roadblocks, putting roadblocks in place. That's the number one roadblock for me. I say for the first 90 days, if you're trying to stop gambling, hand over control of your finances to someone else. Just cut off access. Yeah, very well. Further down the line, then you start to address the, the issues as to why you gamble, like how, like how I've now discovered the euphoria of that win when I was young with my family. And us all being together, like I was chasing that for 20 years. All that work you do sort of over time. But for the first 90 days, it's just about starting, cutting off access, making it as hard as possible for you to, to put a bet on basically putting as many roadblocks in the way as you can. And it worked again for 18 months. I didn't gamble. Stuly had control of everything. I still had a bank card and could still, could still like buy things with my bank card, but knowing she could see everything I was spending money on was enough to, it was enough fear for me to not, not gamble, not bet. My first daughter was born when I was 32. At that point, my life got a lot more busy, a lot more crazy. So I stopped going to my gamblers anonymous meetings and complacency started to creep in. And again, Bitcoin was doing this, was taken off again. It was, it was 2020. It was just before COVID struck and Bitcoin was, was, was sailing off again into the, into the sunset. And I was, I was able to manipulate Julie into, into saying like, listen, it's different now. Let's, let's put money in Bitcoin. I promise I've got control of it. Look, I haven't gambled for 18 months. I know what I'm doing. Just give me the money and we'll, we'll, we'll become millionaires from Bitcoin. Again, that lasted for about three weeks of me doing it sensibly. And then same as every other time it gets out of control. It just like, I I'm doing trades that I shouldn't be doing. I'm, I'm. I found a way to leverage trade again, but this time it was a multiply of a hundred. So if Bitcoin went up 1%, I doubled my money. If it went down 1%, I lost everything. For those of you that aren't familiar with cryptocurrency, a 1% swing can happen in two minutes. Like I could literally lose everything in two minutes. That's how risky it was. That's how, that's how much of a risk I was taking. That's how, that's how much thrill and excitement I needed. I needed, it was, it was all or nothing. I've always been all or nothing thinking type of thing but uh again exact same disastrous consequences and a, a massive low point for me again i haven't told many people about this it was i convinced my wife that i know what i'm doing bitcoin is about to skyrocket let's get some money in there let's get a loan out and bless her just having trust in me and believing the the lies and the seat i was i was coming out with she let me take out a loan this time it was thirty five thousand dollars and I took out this loan, put it into Bitcoin. My, at this point, my wife is now pregnant with our second child. So my first daughter is about 
one years old, maybe 12 months, 14 months old. And she's now a few months pregnant with our second child. I've took this loan. I've just gone straight into overdrive, straight into leverage trading, just trying to, trying to win, win millions straight away. Lost it all. I'm just like, I cannot do this. I cannot tell my five month pregnant wife that I've just lost all this money. Like I'm, I'm petrified of what it'll do to the baby, the stress that I'm going to put on it. So my addicted, manipulative brain reaches out to my family back home. So I'm, I'm over in Australia at this point. All my family is still back in Liverpool. I reach out to my family back home and I just explain the situation. And I'm like, I cannot do this to my wife. I cannot tell her. I need you all to help me. I need you to get me out of this mess. Once my wife gives birth to my second child, then I'll tell her. I'll come clean. I'll tell her everything. So my family are able to, to get the money together, get it over to me. I pay off the loan in full, a screenshot that the loan is paid off in full, send it back to my family. Here's the proof. Look, it's all done. Right, for five months, I'm just going to get my head down. And then once, once my second baby comes out, I'll, I'll tell Julie what's going on. The day after I've paid off that loan, I call the loan company up and I say, I'm so sorry. I've actually made a mistake. I was only, I was only supposed to make a one week payment. It's like the payment for this week. I've accidentally paid the full loan off. Can you give me the loan back? They have given me the full loan back again. So at this point, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm a loose cannon. I'm a headless chicken at this point. I've got all this money. No one knows about it but me. No one, like I'm so deep now. Julie doesn't even know I've lost the first loan. My family know I've covered the first loan. My family don't know I've now took the loan out again, the money that they've got me. I'm now using it again. And it's just, at this point, the bets are just, it's desperation. I'm just desperate to get myself out of this mess because I'm like, I, it's never, it's never me thinking, right? Fuck my family. Fuck what my mom thinks. I'm going to go and do this. It's never that. It's always, I, I know what I'm doing. I know I can, I can double, treble, quadruple this money and then I can put all the money back and I can fix everything. I'll buy everyone's forgiveness. That was what my addictive brain used to tell me. Like I'd always be convinced that I'm going to win and then I'll put everything back. And then the final nail in the coffin, the, the final night, I remember it well. It was a Friday night. I've woke up at 2 a.m. and I can't sleep. And I go downstairs and I'm just looking at the Bitcoin charts. And I've started playing around. I've started leverage trading. And I almost had it all back. Like I'm, I'm, I'm six figures deep at this point. And I remember all I was, I was maybe three or four thousand pounds, three or four thousand dollars, sorry, Australian dollars short of, of getting everything back. And I, I remember sitting there, it's about four o'clock in the morning at this point. And I remember saying to myself, wow. You've nearly got all this back. Once you've got it all back, you can fix everything. You can pay it all back. And there was a voice in the back of my head that just went, you won't, you won't stop. And I just, I just buried that voice. I was just like, nah, I just, I didn't listen to that voice. But I remember it was my, it was my own voice saying to me, you won't stop. I just ignored it. I was like, I know what I'm doing. So that was the Friday night, Saturday morning, 4 a.m. By the Monday, I'd lost it all. I'd like completely got just, yeah. I, I was just, again, just a new rock bottom. Like it was the umpteen rock bottom that I'd hit in my life. And I was just like, how, how do I do this? So the, the lowest ever moment was me sitting in my kitchen. I remember sitting at the table in my kitchen. My wife is across the kitchen and I'm sorry, I was actually, take, take you back a few hours. I was actually at a Gambler's Anonymous meeting and I came clean and told all them what happened. And it was, an, it was an evening meeting. It was about 8 p.m. So it was like 9.30, 10 p.m. by the time I was getting home. And I said to all the boys, and they were all like, you need to tell your wife. You need to like come clean about it. And I said to them, I went, all right, I'll do everyone a deal now. If I get home and she's awake, I'll tell her. If she's asleep, I'll leave her till, till whenever. As I've pulled off, all the lights are off. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have to tell her. I can survive for another day. Like, I'm, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference to the financial mess that I've created, to the emotional damage I've done, to the trust I've broken time and time again. But just, I've got one more day of not having to tell her. I've got one more day of living this lie where everything's okay. Even though I know in my head, my head's just, I'm on the verge of a mental breakdown at this point. As I go into the house, the kitchen lights on in the back and my heart just sinks. I'm like, she's in the kitchen in the back. So I sat down at the table. I told her. She's pregnant with my second child. She just dropped to the floor crying. I've got up from the table to go and try and help her, try and pick her up. And she's just screamed at me to leave her alone. Don't touch her. And it was just like, like I'm getting, I'm getting a lump in my throat now. Just, just reliving the moments. It was, 
I, I can't it's I can't describe it. It was just the lowest of lows. I was like, this is the new rock bottom now. Like I I'd had various moments in my life where I just I'd thought about suicide, just it had got that bad. It had got that so secretive and so deep. Nobody else knew about it. And I don't, before I actually told her that night, I remember a few few days previous, I just thought, I can just go to my old apartment block where we used to live. I still had a key for it. I can get to the roof there. I can message my family, tell them I love them, and I can just jump up and just end it all. Luckily, I had a force of my two daughters growing up without a dad in their life, and that was enough for me to just... Maybe you er- me up to <laughs> That was enough for me to just eradicate that thought there, and then I was like... I, I, I was, I was, I'd pictured the whole thing. I was like, I was going to take a 10 pack of cider up there with me. I was unsure if I was going to video my family so they could actually see me doing it. Or I was just going to send them a video note, tell them how much I love them. But as soon as that thought came into my head, I was like, imagine my two daughters growing up without a dad. I was just like, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not taking the coward's way out. This, I'm facing up to it. And then that's what started the process of me going to the gamblers anonymous and eventually telling my wife. My suitcase was packed for me the next day when I arrived home my wife told me you need to go to rehab it's 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 this if you want if you want and my wife said if you want to keep me yeah. and my unborn daughter and my born daughter in 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 my life I need to go to rehab to to get myself better was completely on board with it was happy more than happy to go I remember in there while I was in there like some of the stuff I just didn't understand it was like Similar to what they say on an airplane where you've got to put your mask on before helping others there. It's like, if you don't love yourself, you're not going to be able to love your children. And I was like, what's this bullshit? I don't care about myself. I'm here for my kids. I'm, I want to get better for my kids. I, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the, the therapist saying that to me at the time. As, as time went on in there, a, a guy who was like, who was in the rehab center three years previous and had been clean for three years, he'd come back in to do a tour. And I remember this vividly at where I was sitting in the room and I was hanging on his every word. And he said to me, he said to us all, but I felt like he was talking directly to me. He said, there's three types of people in here, in this rehab center right now. There's people who are here to stay out of jail. There's people who are here to please someone else. Basically what the situation I was in, I was there to keep my wife in my life. And there's people who are here who genuinely want to get sober. I thought that was me. I thought I genuinely wanted to get better. I genuinely wanted to get on top of this addiction. The stuff I learned in rehab was immense. I learned so much about myself, about how addiction works, about why I was addicted. However, as soon as I remember the first day coming back home from, I was, it was an in-hab rehab center. I was away from my family for three weeks. I remember the first day I came back, like my one-year-old daughter, I remember her looking at me and like, she was looking at me, like she recognized me, but she didn't know who I was. And that proper killed me. I was like, this is like the first ever time I'd been away from her for three weeks. She was only a year old. And she looked at me like she knew who I was, but she sort of didn't. She sort of like recognized me and knew I was someone. And I was just like, I never, ever want to do that to my children again. I never want my daughters to not know who their dad is again. Yeah. But uh, literally 10 minutes later, my mother-in-law had a list of jobs for me as long as my aunt. It's like, you've been away three weeks. This needs doing, that needs doing, that needs doing. And it was just, I didn't have time. Everything I'd learned in rehab, I didn't have time to put that into practice. I didn't have the time to put that into my life. As you can imagine that, a busy, stressful life with a, a, a wife that was ready to pop on a one-year-old and working full-time. And all the stuff I learned just sort of went on the back burner. It never, never quite got, got put into my life. It just sort of, it was there in the back of my head. I thought that was good enough. I thought, I, I know all that stuff now. I don't need to, I don't need to be practicing it on a daily basis. Like the exercises I need to do and all that. It's okay. As long as I'm aware of it, that's good enough. Six months later, I found myself in the same situation again. I found myself manipulating my wife into allowing me to do Bitcoin. The exact same thing happened, got out of control, did, did more financial damage, more trust damage, more, just more damage everywhere. And that was it. That was like, you know what? Luckily, the financial damage was pretty limited, but the emotional damage and the trust issues, just that was, oh, yeah. that was like my new rock bottom. And I was, I was just, everything I learned in rehab, I now need to do on a daily basis. I now need to start learning to love myself. I, and I, I, I always go back to that thing the guy told me. There's three types of people who were here. And I was like, I wasn't there to get, genuinely get sober. I was there to keep my family and my life. I genuinely want to get sober now. And that has been the biggest game changer for me. That's why I've been able to, to turn my life around these last three years. I finally realized I want to get better for myself. 
I can't live this stressful life anymore. I can't live this secret of life that no one knows about. And I've got all this stress inside of me. I've got all these secrets inside of me. The peace of mind of just knowing my wife can pick up my phone. She's not going to find anything that I've got hidden. I don't have to beat the mailman to the, to the letterbox. I don't have to keep my wife out of my email accounts. The fact that everything is out on the table is just that feeling is just priceless to me. Like that, that is what's never, that's what, that is what's going to keep me away from ever going back to a bet. Just this peace of mind that I've had these last few years is just priceless. I just, it's the best part of recovery for me. Like the, the debts, the debts have slowly been getting paid off and that's, that's like, that's obviously what everyone thinks about, about recovery. They think like, I'll have money. That's not the best part of it. The best part of it is just people trusting you again. My wife trusting me, like getting my wife's trust, my family being proud of me. My mum tells me every day how proud of me she is. And it's just, it puts a lump in my throat every day. Stuff like that is priceless. And doing all the work every day, like realizing my people pleasing tendencies. Like I'd, I'd say yes to someone when I want to say no, because my people please, I'd say yes. And then I'd secretly resent myself to escape that resentment. I'd then go and gamble. Just realizing little things like that just make the world a difference because now I see, I realize that happening in motion and I'm able to say no. I'm able to, to have uncomfortable conversations with people. It's just, it's made me the person I always should have been. So what made you want to help people then? What, what's kind of brought about the stuff that you've been doing on YouTube? And like, like I say now, just this, the, the whole time I was gambling, I was convinced it was the money. It wasn't, it was because I wasn't able to deal with life on life's terms, but I can now. You know, that first ever Gamblers Anonymous meeting I went to, there was a guy in there that said, like, I've, I'm seven years without a bet. And right in that moment, I just went, I wish I, I wish I had those seven years. Now I understand those seven years wouldn't help me. I need my own recovery journey. Everybody needs their own recovery journey. These last three years that I've done, nobody's got an identical story to that. Everyone's got their own story. Everyone's got their own, their own reason they gamble, their own reason they continue to gamble, and their own reason that they need to stop gambling. Like, so I say I had to go through 20 years of pain and misery and struggling to get here. I needed to hit those rock bottoms in order to turn around. However, I feel, I feel there's, there's always, if I, I know if I go back to gambling, there's a new rock bottom waiting for me, 100%. I, I, I can smash through that previous rock bottom and I can find another one. So what I'm trying to do is help people stop at the rock bottom that they're at now. Instead of doing what I did and just smashing through floor after floor after floor after rock bottom after rock bottom and taking 20 years to get on top of it. Not, not everyone's as lucky as me. Some people don't get out of it after 20 years. Some people deal with it their whole lives. If I can help someone stop just a little bit earlier than, than what they stop in their own, or even if they, they wouldn't be able to stop, but I help them stop just that, like that, that feeling of, of passing on what I've learned. Like in, in Air Japan, there's someone called Ikigai and it's like, four things it's like something that the world needs uh, something that you're good at something that you're passionate about something that you can like make it make make your 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 everyday life this is my he guy i'm like i'm i'm i always say i'm good at it because i was such a fuck up i fucked up so bad in every single way that i've got the experience of getting over every single one of them no matter what story you tell me i've done something similar i can help guide you through it I'm so, like, gambling was the only thing I was ever passionate about. Now, recovery is the thing I'm passionate about. I, I just love it. I love my own recovery, and I just love hearing other people's stories. Like, I still do free support groups every week. I still log on to free Zoom meetings every week of support groups, and that's not because I'm on the edge of my seat about to go and gamble if, if, I, don't, if I don't go to that support group. I go to that support group because I've built up, like, a network of, of friends there. I like hearing about their stories. I like sharing what, what's going on for me, what struggles I've had this week, and how I've dealt with them. There's no such thing as a, as a bad meeting when I get on these support groups. Like I can't lose. If I if I hear someone who's 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 been at it this week and they're really struggling, like they've just gambled this week, I can hear the pain in their voice and the struggle that they're going through, and that reminds me what's what's out there waiting for me if I go back to it. Or I'll get someone who's 20 years clean and they tell me like, oh, I took I took my daughters to the football this week and it was just amazing, and I'm like, that's in inspiration for me. I, I can now I can do that. I can be the dad that I always wanted to be to my daughters because I'm not tied up in this addiction anymore. My head isn't, isn't somewhere else. I just, I, I, I love the life I've now got and I want to help people get, get that life themselves. I don't want this addiction to, to take away anyone else's life like it took away mine for 20 years. Well, I think what's really important is taking on 
a responsibility. You know, like now you're helping people. You've you've got a responsibility to not fuck up. Do you know what I mean? Because you're yeah, accountability. You've got to practice. You've got to practice what you preach. Hundred percent. So I think I think by helping others, you're helping yourself, and then it's kind of you, you know it's gonna it's it's, it's another it's dumb, it's double layers. Yeah, it's another layer of security for me that yeah. I'm not only accountable to myself, I'm not only accountable to my, my wife and my daughters, I'm accountable to these people I'm trying to help. I've, I've got to set the example that, that I'm, I've got to practice what I preach. You said it there. It is. It's like a new level. level of course. Cool. Awesome, yeah. Yeah. So you've got to do it. And then, uh, the, well, there's another Japanese concept, which I like called Kaizen, which is a, the car industry. So every day they try and improve 1%. So I think now you're on this journey, you can keep on improving, like make your video is better, practice teaching people, talking to people, and you, you're on the right side of it. And it's much more fulfilling to help people anyway than win money. Yeah, 100%. Like, the ha half of the stuff that I get out of recovery, it's nothing to do with money. It's like the, that peace of mind, that that knowing that my wife trusts me. I can't put a price on that. It's nothing to do with money. It's just, like, those human emotions are just, are just above all else. I love it. I do. I mean, pe people have known this for our history, all the philosophers, no one ever. I, I had a great quote from Mike Tyson who said, um, if you think getting, having a lot of money is going to um, going to make your life better, then you've never had a lot of money. I think that's it's just a brilliant quote because he he's been on he's he's been on he's been on top of hundreds of millions, and it's like it, it still doesn't make anything better because life's life doesn't care how much money you've got. It's yeah, your impact on other people yeah. essentially, which is what makes you. I was expecting a different quote there from Mike Tyson, the one where it's something like uh, every everyone's everyone's a. I can't remember. Everyone's a, a, a good boxer until they get hit in the face or something like that. Everyone's got a mouth so they get punched in the face. I thought that was the one you were going to go with. But no, I, I like it because it, it's like, I mean, there's loads of people who've said that they've had loads of money. And it doesn't, it doesn't bring any happiness. It just brings more problems. So, what, so even the end goal of that. Yeah, what keeps coming to mind now is uh, Ma Matthew Perry, who rest in peace, who we yeah, just lost. He, he's, he's, there's many videos of him saying, like similar to what Jim Carrey says. I want everyone to achieve everything they've ever wanted to get, and then they realize that's not what that's not what they want. Like to realize it's 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 back to this destination addiction again. It's not about the end goal; it's the it's the journey. Exactly. So they they, they say in gambles anonymous, one day at a time, and that was pretty overwhelming for me. I was like, for the rest of my life, one day at a time, I can't gamble. Like that's that overwhelms me. I've changed it, and I'm like working on myself, improving myself is a project that I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life, and I'm completely okay with that. Like you said before, uh, uh, James Clear, Atomic Habits, get 1% better every day, similar to, to what you just said. Yeah. That, I, it, it doesn't even need to be 1%. 0.1% is good enough. If I'm 35% better at the end of this year, that is a massive improvement. That's good enough for me. So that's what I say now. My, my goal is to, is to get, just learn the struggles, learn my issues, get a little bit better at, at dealing with them. Instead of trying to, like life, I always thought life was about taking away the struggle. Now I'm in recovery. I can't, I've realized you can't take away. So there's going to be difficult moments in life. There's going to be struggles in life. I've learned how to deal with them. I've learned how to be okay, accepting those struggles and how to overcome them. When I was gambling, it was always just, I'm going to win all this money and I'll never have any problems in my life ever because I can just throw money at any problems I have. Whereas now I've accepted there's going to be problems. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be issues. I'm able to hit them issues, them struggles head on and tackle them head on and I've got the tools in my toolbox to be able to to overcome them. That's what recovery has given me. I think I think one last thing to mention is um you said about like not keeping it to yourself and talking about it. Like it, it is true when you like I've, I've had problems before and you talk about it, it. The relief that you feel when you've let it out and it's the secret that kills you inside a lot and a lot of the time. I think that's gonna help a lot of people if you just admit to stuff. Definitely. Any anyone like that my my advice for anyone new in the support groups, anyone listening today who's, who's struggling with addiction is ad, like admitting I cannot control my gambling was the first step. When I finally realized if I have a small bet today, whether it's a day, a week, a month, a year later, it will get out of control again. I can't do that first bet. So admitting you cannot control whatever has got a grip of you, that is the first step. Coming clean, sharing about it, speaking to your loved ones, maybe not. Some people would be more comfortable sharing to their loved ones. Some people would be more comfortable sharing in a support group to a room full of strangers. Whichever one, share with somebody, find somebody you can confide in and come clean and get that off your shoulders. 
seeking professional help was very important for me. I saw a psychotherapist and a gambling counselor simultaneously. They helped me understand why I gambled, what was going on in my head as I was gambling and any like childhood trauma or anything like that. Support groups, being with your peers, sharing your problems, listening to their problems, helping them. Just the opposite to addiction is connection, just connecting with people. And then all four of those points fall into one thing where I say, build up your support network, build up your recovery community. I've got people I'll speak to on a daily basis. I've got people I'll speak to on a weekly basis from all over the world, just to check in, just to, just to check how they're going and just to let them know what's going on with me. It's not because I'm on the edge of icy gambling if I don't, but just connect them with people. Just, it, it keeps me on the straight and narrow. Just like you've just said, sharing with people what's going on is just, it's, it's, it is, it's a release. It's just, it, it's a weight off your shoulders. So those, those five points for me are how, how you get started on your recovery journey. So how, how can people find you then? What you're watching and what's your plan now? So my YouTube channel is just starting out now, uh, Addictors Recovery, no space in between it. We've, we've got a couple of episodes. I think we're up to episode six at the minute. Every week, minimum one video a week, every week I'm trying to get an upload of a new episode. I've committed to that for the next 12 months. So there's plenty of time for everyone to get on board and get involved with me and, and follow along. And I'm trying to be as interactive as I can. I want people to comment. I want people to get in touch with me and, and reach out to me. And like I keep saying, connection is the way forward. I want to connect with people on this channel. So if you can get onto my channel, watch some of my videos, even subscribe, I'm, I'm going to be there for, for a long time. This is, this is the beginning of something special for me. Well, well, I mean, like, just thank you for coming on today. And I think it's quite brave to talk about what you've done. And I, 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 this is a good point to like share with your friends what you've been through. Cause like they won't think any less of you. Like you will, you will think they think less of you, but when they listen to it, I think they just feel like they want you to get over it. And like, yeah, they, they want what's best for you. Definitely. Yeah. If they're real friends, they'll, they'll want what's best for you and you can tell them anything. So get it out there. But I will put down his YouTube video in the comments, his his channel and and, and we'll share this. Um uh, so yeah, thanks Danny. Is there anything you wanna leave us with before we end there? Just just a massive thank you to you for for reaching out. This is the first ever time I've I've done anything like this. You can't see it on camera, but I've been trembling like anything underneath. My feet have been ticking the floor. But uh yeah, nah, just a massive thank you for for giving me this opportunity to get on your channel and, and hopefully just spreading my spreading my message a little bit further. Yeah, I mean, just thanks for being so brave because it, it, like, this is the deepest I've gone on a podcast and it's it, it's hard to do, but it's it's worthwhile if it helps someone. So uh, I'll end it there. So thanks, Danny. Thanks again, Alex. Take care.